Welcome to DrupalCon again. Thanks for coming. Um, I get the um, I get the bleary-eyed one more coffee session now, I guess. Uh, and I have another one tomorrow. So I get the very earliest thing in the morning on the first day, Tuesday, 8 a.m. at DrupalCon, and apparently I get to close the <clears throat> close the days other way. Um, so I know some of you in the audience. Um, how many of you are developers? How many of you are business agency owners? Um, and how many are um, sort of end users of Drupal businesses who your actual business isn't Drupal? Nobody. How many of you are named Hugh? Good, thank you. All right. <laughs> so um, I saw this tweet and I thought it was interesting. Um, you know, if you're not paying for it, don't base your business model on it. And then, uh, and then, well, that's a funny question when we don't pay money for the software we use, right? Um, so I clarified, uh, if, we, if we contribute, is that, does that count as payment? And, you know, luckily the internet told me, yes, um, sweat equity counts as, as paying for what we do. I want to talk about the, the business value of contribution from from a couple of different standpoints. Uh, we are here because of open source and it makes sense to us probably intuitively that we need to contribute. But a lot of us struggle with perhaps explaining to management or explaining to our friends and colleagues um, why we should do it. And I contend that it's not a set of moral or emotional arguments. I think there's real strong business value in it. Um, the other side of this session is um, how to integrate uh, contribution organically into developer workflows. Unfortunately, my good friend Chris Janssen <clears throat> is sick today and not able to be in Vienna and not able to do the session with us. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris got a new job and uh, he's, the competence, he's the Drupal competence lead at a company called Ordina in uh, Holland and that's a big classic IT delivery organization, 1,500 people. Um, and he is um, a pretty senior person in the Drupal unit now, and he got a really cool job. He, about 50% of his time is development. A quarter of his time is doing pre-sales support, so telling the open source story and telling the technical story of Drupal to potential clients. And a quarter of his job is to be, to work on team development, right? So his actual job, and he's gonna have KPIs around it, is to ensure and raise the competence and professionalism of his team. Um, and for us, for him, that ties directly into contribution. Um, interacting with OS communities makes you the best possible developer. Um, I'm quoting him. Um, and he got his job because of his reputation and commitment to contribution, as well as his, you know, he's a shit hot developer. So, he's so technical expertise plus his really strong commitment to, um, to quality and, and contribution got a, a, a nice job. So. Unfortunately, Chris can't be here today. He would be really, really, uh, so the structure of the presentation is gonna be probably a little heavier on my side of things and a little lighter on his side of things because I, I know what his slides are about, but they're not my slides. He'd be really, really happy to talk with any of you and go into much more depth about the developer processes and the, the measuring that side of things. Um, there's his email, there's his Twitter, and his Drupal.org ID is also Legolas Bo, so um, you know, please, please feel free to get in touch with him. Most people call me Jam. Uh, I've been around in Drupal for a long time, uh, 11, 12 years, and um, <clears throat> I am the co-founder of a marketing strategy communication company called Open Strategy Partners, and we do, we talk about this stuff uh, in a lot of different ways, this space uh, between business value and open source and, and, and communities and all of that uh, is, is what we're about. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty easy to find online. Um, Horn Cologne on Twitter and Drupal.org. So let's get right into this. Um, can someone tell me when we actually have to stop? Is it at 545? At six? Whew. Okay, so this is a luxury presentation. No, this is awesome. So the thing is that usually I have like 35 minutes to get through this, but right now, ooh, that's awesome. Okay, so in the next 40 slides, um, I want to talk, um, talk just to make sure that we're on the same page about 
the benefits of using open source. Um, and it should be familiar to all of us, but it, it, it's good to just make sure that we're all in the same place. And then want to talk about, in principle, why we contribute, why we should contribute. Um, what are roadblocks to contribution from a business management perspective and from an operational development perspective, how we remove those, and now go how to go contribute, what to do to contribute, what sort of contribution is effective and interesting. <clears throat> and then um, I'd be happy to talk about any of this if we have any time left at the end. A uh, guy called Edmund Burke, who, living in the uh, 18th century, said, um, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. So uh, I take that to be a call to action um, to contribute, right? The worst thing that we could do for Drupal or PHP or any part of open source is sit back and eat it and not ever come to a conference again and not ever write a patch again, right? And we have to remember that, you know, when we download Drupal, right, we're getting millions of hours of coding for free, like minute zero of any client project. We are delivering literally millions, billions of euros of value out of the gate. That's kind of exciting. That's an interesting sales point, I think. So um, how many of you can have contributed to open source software? OK. And how many of you think you haven't contributed to open source software? Have you ever filed a bug report? You filed a bug report? So you help somebody fix it, right? And, and have you ever asked a question in a con? You, wait a minute, but you've been to DrupalCon, right? Did you buy a ticket? OK. So, you're, we're, well, we're off the hook there. Did you ever ask a question at this event? All right. So, but see, um, being here and being part of this community is already a contribution. And there's, it's so much more than just code, right? And that's a really, really important thing to remember. So. Let's just remember what we're talking about. The benefits of using open source software. <clears throat> um, well, we don't have to pay money to get the license to use the software. So we have a license fee of zero. It's not free. And if you tell your clients it's free, you're going to set bad expectations, right? Because IT is an expensive game. Um, you have reduced development costs because you don't have to pay a license fee. You don't have to pay for the development tools. I mean, you have to buy a computer and stuff, but right, uh, everybody does if they want to be online. Um, you can get your project to market faster because we have a grand tradition of reuse and, and, and so on in open source. Um, we have an improved project ROI for a couple of reasons, but fundamentally, right, we don't have to pay money to ask permission to see if this thing is going to work at some point down the road for us. We can simply tell, you know, Tommy, download Drupal. You have a week's time to see if you can make a work, working concept, and that costs your salary for the week, and that's, that's very little risk, right? I'm going to pay you your salary anyway, hopefully. So um, we have a, a improved return on investment, reduced costs over the lifetime of the project, um, and reduced vendor locket is important. There's no, you know, licensed Vienna uh, dealer of Drupal that we have to go through to get our services. All of us as Drupal service providers, we have to do the give the best service possible. Um, open source service providers, uh, anyone can walk away and find another one uh, uh, of a project at critical mass. So, so th there's a lot of people out there, and, and it helps open source so uh, projects pass the truck test, right? The, the project is going to survive even without us. If we pay zero money to have the license to use open source software, um, our IT project still costs money. We still have people. We still have to host it. We still have to pay for bandwidth and so on. So it doesn't matter in the comparison between proprietary and open source that the license fee is zero. It's just an IT project. All these aspects is going to cost the same amount of money. But when we come to using open source, um, we can create or improve the features we need when we need them. And you know, Drupal has a great tradition of releasing cutting edge features as soon as they come out. Um, the, it's an old story now, but it's the, it's the one I've got in my head. Um, when Google released the at font face property, who remembers when the web only had six or seven fonts? Yeah, so when, when Google created the at font face, um, which allowed us to make a beautiful internet, does anybody know how long it took for the Drupal implementation of that to be um, uh, live and ready to use? Take a guess. Wait, who said a week? 
Christina, right? Yeah. yeah. And you said an hour. Um, it was actually 24 hours, but it's pretty impressive. You know, I don't know how long Adobe or Sitecore took, but I, I'm guessing it was longer than 24 hours, right? Um, there are thousands of us providing service. Um, it's open source. We, 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 our data is our own. Um, <clears throat> so every euro, every dollar that we spend on an open source project, we're automatically investing in features. We're not, in, we're not asking for permission. We're not paying for that. So we can train up our staff. We can hire more people. We can make it more beautiful. We can add something. Um, and there's an old saying um, that I learned from someone at my former employer, you know, we can build it better, not cheaper. So uh, we really shouldn't be competing on price with each other. Um, but we can deliver a better project by taking the same budget and re reallocating it into things that we actually care about in our projects, right? So very, very quick refresher into, you know, what we're doing here and why our clients should choose open source solutions. Um, <clears throat> so what's blocking developers from contributing? Now, I want to point out that the blue slides are Chris's, right? This is where I might stumble. Um, the, the green slides are mine. The blue <laughs> slides are Chris's. So pretend I'm about this tall and blonde and have a Dutch accent now. Um, and no, I can't do a Dutch accent. Um, how many of you technical people ever wanted to contribute but felt that you couldn't? You felt blocked, okay? And um, were you blocked <clears throat> because you didn't know how to contribute or what to contribute? Was that, did that ever happen? Yeah, maybe. Um, or you maybe, who, you didn't feel you had time to contribute? Your, your boss doesn't let you do that on billable time, that's a, right? Okay, or how many of you just like thought, Wow, you know, Angie Byron and Alex Pott and, and Daniel Vayner, like they wrote this code. I couldn't possibly touch it. Like I'm not good enough to, to touch. Wow, okay, that's bad. Because um, it was all built by people like us, right? Um, so Chris, uh, at his uh, old job, he did a really, really interesting project. He was working while finishing his bachelor's degree. And for his bachelor's thesis, he started looking into um, enabling developers to contribute. And that's actually the origin story of this uh, presentation, because I was developing how to talk to management about contribution, and he was developing how to enable developers to do more contribution, and we met in the middle, and this is the project that's resulted of it. So I'm having a real trouble seeing these slides from here. Um, and I guess the purple thing is not really so readable, right? Um, people felt, I'm going to grab the other microphone. These mind maps get way too big to read um, in this presentation, so just don't, it's just, that's how it is. Um, so people felt they had a lack of knowledge. They didn't really know how to contribute, right? How do I get things out of CVS in the old days? Um, they doubted their own skills. They didn't have enough time. It wasn't clear whether they were allowed to contribute, right? And then um, that led to a lack of motivation. There were barriers along the way, like, um, how do I know if the scope, how, no, how do I know how long it's gonna test, and, and all of these sort of things. Um, so here was a set of blockers around contribution that Chris identified across developer teams. And he also um, surveyed a lot of people outside of his company once he established uh, these barriers in, in that place. So then he also, he also spotted um, negative catalysts. Um, so the purplish things are barriers, and then the orange things are what he calls negative catalysts. You know, not knowing what you're doing, it really takes energy and time to, fit, to, to get to being able to do it. And if you have a lack of time already, then you're pretty much screwed. It's not going to happen, right? And if you don't know how to do it, maybe you don't want to look stupid in front of your colleagues, like, oh, if I don't know how to, you know, um, uh, submit a patch upstream or, like, you know, deal with the issue queues on Drupal.org, I just started here, maybe I should, I'm supposed to know that, right? So they could be embarrassed about it. And all of this stuff around, what, is this even allowed? Did I get scope, right? So Chris identified these things he calls negative catalysts and then started working on ways to solve these problems. Um, Providing training and guidance 
um, clearly unblocks a lot of this. And when you're training people and, and providing, um, you know, a weekly hackathon or, you know, a contribution uh, day at work with, with mentored contribution like we do in, for example, at DrupalCon, all of a sudden people's proficiency is improved um, and then it'll take less time to do it and then they know how to do it. And a lot of these things get unblocked, right? And so there's communication culture there. Um, just getting the, the definition of done in a project to include contributing patches upstream um, completely changes the motivational picture, for example. So, so this is a really, really interesting mind map. I'm happy to send you the slides if you'd like them. So, <clears throat> so this was the result of Chris's work, one of the results of Chris's work. Now, as open source people, right, as business people, we say, well, you know, of course we're going to contribute because, you know, it's open source. This is perfectly obvious to us that we are going to contribute because, you know, it's the right thing to do because community, right? Because, um, you know, that's why we're here, okay? But um, these are not business reasons. You can't take this to your board. You can't take this to your investors. You can't, you, there's, this is just emotional crap, right? Uh, these reasons don't pay the bills and they don't provide any ROI and they're actually not measurable, right? And, and that's why we're here and that's my part of the talk. Um, um, th and, and there's some, some really good reasons that I'll talk about uh, uh, now going through. So here we get to this point of identifying contribution roadblocks, and we'll call them um, we'll call them operational contribution and strategic contribution. So strategic contribution that is uh, a lack of vision, a lack of corporate policy, a lack of support for contribution. That's a that's a, a strategic roadblock to contribution, and then operational roadblocks. Um, you know, fear, doubt, lack of time, lack of a mandate for the technical teams, right? So strategic roadblocks. Um, I'm a real fan of Simon uh, Sinek and his, uh, <clears throat> his uh, talk, how, uh, how Great Leaders Inspire Action. I really, really like this. And so it's uh, talking about this idea about starting with the why. Why do we do something? So I want to tell the manager why the company should contribute if... So the idea of this golden circle, right, if you start with what, what do we do? We contribute, okay, write some patches, go! Well, how do you measure that? How do you know that anything is any better for that? How do you know that your company or your product is now better because you wrote some patches or you had a hack? You don't know. So if you start with what you're doing, you can't measure what you're doing. You can't know if you have any impact. So if you define wh why your organization contributes, which is what I want to help you with now, you can then create a mandate to contribute and decide how that contribution is going to take place. And as soon as you define the how, we are going to sponsor, we are going to write contribute patches upstream, and we are going to train apprentices, right? What you do becomes perfectly clear. How many did we train? Um, how much did we improve our project? And so on. So, so this is a really, really valuable um, model. And there's no, there's no sensible way of doing this from the outside. Operational roadblocks um, start if you don't have a why, right? If there's not a policy in place that lets you do it, you just don't even know if you can. Or maybe you're prohibited from doing non-billable things. Um, if you don't know how to do it, there's no how. And if there aren't procedures, definitions, measurable things in place, there's no what to do it. There's no sensible way. So um, doubts about own skills lack of time, and so on. These are operational roadblocks that, that stop developer teams. Does this feel familiar? Okay, cool. So, these are the blockers that Chris identified in his old company, and I guess we already had this diagram. So let's just go on. I can't find anything like especially new in his notes, so, okay. So, there's this thing called the boss talk. Um, um, this, is, this is also about, like, overall about longer-term systematic thinking versus, versus quick wins. Um, open source contribution brings clear and reasonably me quite measurable economic advantages along the way um, for your organization. So, so, I mean, 
really simply, you know, we are here, right? D open source is working, um, and uh, without contribution, this project wouldn't exist, our companies wouldn't exist, and you know, we wouldn't have the prod product of 15 years of, of 16, 17 years of work to build our own things on top of, right? So <clears throat> that's a pretty clear benefit to us. Like, we can do Drupal. Um, there's an idea that you shouldn't really outsource your core competen competencies of your company, so knowing how your software really, really works is essential. You can't just leave it to other people to do it, and contribution is uh, of, of technical contribution, patches and so on, is the, absolutely the best way to know about how your stuff works. Um, and that should improve your ability to acquire and complete projects predictably and profitably and at a high quality. Um, Chris says that uh, there is no better training for developers than interacting with a good open source community. So, you know, just using Drupal properly and contributing and involve, you know, test some patches, submit some patches, implement some patches, write new modules, um, and submit them to community, you're gonna get some really tough love in terms of the feedback about your code quality, about what the modules do, are you addressing the right kind of problems, and that gives you back a better developer. Just letting your developers interact with the community at a technical level makes them better developers, right? And um, it's, you know, given that they're doing this probably while they're trying to solve a problem in a, in a, in a billable project, right, um, that's a cheaper way to do that than paying for explicit training, for example. And, and um, you know, frankly, I'll talk about the HR effects of this later, but it's, it's also generally a great motivation to let people hang out with cool, smart people like us, right? Um, continuous contribution to the stuff that you put into production, it increases quality over time and it increases efficiency over time. All of us tend to center in on a specific tool set, a set of modules, a set of uh, 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 implementation choices. Um, and over time, and especially if we use testing well, we produce a better product every time we produce a product. And we make Drupal, we make our modules, we make the open source projects we use better every single time we do our projects and give back everything we fix along the way. Contributing code upstream allows us not to have to maintain technical debt in-house, which is incredibly expensive and incredibly risky. Maintaining internal liability in-house is stupid when you have an open source community that can help you solve it and take that burden out of your company. Um, doing open source right, submitting your code to the community, in the case of Drupal, Typo3, Symfony, a lot of other projects, um, you get security checks for free. You get 1,000 or 100,000 people using your code. You get government agencies checking if your module's okay to use, right? Security comes for free, that's a nice benefit. Um, and, you know, if you compare doing proper security checks to the cost of outages and hacks and data breaches and so on, you know, that's a pretty good calculation too. Um, really, really relevant to clients is the idea of them paying for a new feature but open sourcing it at the same time. And that's a hard conversation to have with some people. They're like, I have to pay 30 grand for that and everyone else can use it? Um, apart from the idea that Drupal's already there for them and, and, and very valuable, um, you, can, you can tell them, well, hey, you know, upgrades are for free. Um, like, there are smarter people than me out there, and when I, when I put my code out there, um, your business case won't be unique in the long run. Somebody else is gonna want that. They're gonna use it. They're going to refactor my code. They're going to make it more secure. We get better code back every time we, we submit our code and let our other people use it. Um, so the community adds a lot of value to the work that we do. And, you know, if we build a reputation for delivering great projects as business people, that should increase our ability to sell more projects, hence our business does better. Um, that should have a direct effect on marketing and customer acquisition. Um, and then if you build a reputation as a company full of smart devs, right, experts in your field um, who also contribute, maybe you send them to conferences as well, you know, that becomes a real hiring bonus and it becomes a really great retention tool as well. Um, those of you who hire people, like how much is the resume worth and how much is their contribution record worth nowadays? 
right? Like their GitHub account, their Drupal.org. It's, 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 for developers, it's really important now, right? And as a company, you know, you can turn around and you can say, well, we offer, you know, we're specialized in workflows and media and customers know now to say, okay, who are your developers who work on that? Let me see their patches, right? So co contribution is, is really a sales tool too. Um, and retaining employees is really, really important. I read some numbers. Um, the cost of a new technical hire in the UK in 2014 was 32,000 pounds, right? And they uh, had an on-ramp time on average of 29 weeks before they reached full productivity. Um, so there's a 25,000 pound loss in productive output um, plus recruitment costs plus temp hire costs, plus everything else that you go through at the time, loss of capacity and so on. So there's a ton of value in contributing and putting your name on it, right? Um, and then there's this other aspect, right? There's this um, strategic, um, so, so, and that's just contribution to the stuff that you have in production, the stuff that you're trying to sell. If you can get to a place where you let your employees interact with other open source projects, just give them a day a month or, 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 or however you want to calculate it to say, just go do something in open source, like go figure out a new framework or, or, or check out Symfony, or it doesn't matter. It shouldn't be something in production. They're going to come back with new paradigms, new ways of interacting, like tell them to go submit a patch in another community. And they're going to come back, you know, potentially with new skills and new, new uh, perspectives on how to deliver better projects for you too. So, so there's this whole world of if you can, if you can believe in and trust in the value of, of contribution simply for your, your bread and butter stuff, going beyond the bread and butter at some point is a really, really um, interesting experiment. Um, Contribution snowballs. A lot of companies, when you tell them, hey, you should really be contributing, like, uh, uh, they're like, oh my God, okay, so we have to build something from scratch, we have to invest thousands of hours of time and like a full testing suite and blah, 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 and it becomes like too much. Oh, how could we possibly do that? We're not in a vacuum, right? We are in open source communities and you're not doing this alone and if you contribute, now this is a really interesting insight for me, if you contribute during a project and part of the building of the project is contribution, right, um, not only do you reduce your, um, that shouldn't say reduces project ROI, should it? Hmm. That should say that it increases your ROI, it, re it reduces your cost, so it increases, there we go, it's just like Wikipedia here. <laughs> so, you build a better project um, and you put it out, your overall project is better and it does better, but it, it, it reduces project costs if you do it right. And I was fascinated. I was talking with Miro Dietikert from MD Systems about this and he's a huge contributor. Just put the reduce Good, thank you, you're exactly right. So, so I was like, what do you mean it reduces immediate project cost, Miro? Because that sounds like aren't you just doing more work? Um, and he's like, no, no, no. Picture the difference. You've got, you need a feature, right? Build it from scratch. Take a module that does 50% of what you need and call the maintainer and pay her to finish her module for what you need, right? Um, you get it done faster um, and you, you know, your team does its thing and you're supporting the open source project at the same time, right? And this is fascinating. And he said this completely plays out economically. Um, t uh, contributing as hard as possible to open source while building current projects uh, reduces their costs as well. So, um, have to talk about this with management and get everyone to agree that there is economic value, there's bottom line measurable value in this, um, and then you define a contribution policy. You say, hey, we want to contribute and we are going to you know, allocate this much time or this much budget or these kind of activities. Work on that with the technical department, create a mandate for the technical department to then implement and come back and when everyone's in agreement, um, you know, uh, you can get on with it. And I think that uh, 
In terms of economic measurability, there's, a, there's one more point that I found really fascinating. You can probably say in your organization, a, uh, contributing a patch costs, you know, an average of, like from start to finish fixing something, is four hours of time. Or six or eight or 20 minutes, I don't know what it is. Um, and you should be able to calculate that in your organization. And then you know what your average cost of a developer is. Um, and then that means that if it were four hours and your developer costs you 100 euros an hour, a patch costs 400 euros, right? When you've open sourced a module and the community gives you back 10 patches, right? That's a lot of value that the community has delivered to you economically. And that's a really, really nice, it's a really, really nice way to uh, think about the value of, of, of how we're interacting with each other. So, we're going to solve these problems. Um, we need to increase the contribution proficiency of our technical teams, um, as well as, you know, so now we've changed the policy in our organization, and we're trying to get people more competent and give them more time to work. Um, so, Chris suggests that mentored code sprints are incredibly effective, like even bring in somebody from the Drupal world who you know is a good mentor and, and bring them in for a day or a weekend or a week or what have you. Um, and it's a really great way to have uh, knowledge transfer, support that person and so on. Um, organize internal sprints and stimulate collaboration. Um, look at the tradition of uh, uh, the DevOps, you know, non, uh, uh, non-violent communication style, you know, blameless reviews and so on encourage a, uh, a culture of, of, um, of collaboration and share success stories. Um, and uh, then if people really trust each other, you know, you should be able to share your failures and, and learn from those too. Um, if you provide opportunities for training and contribution mentorship, your developers will reduce the time spent per contribution, so they're gonna get faster. They're going to make contributions with a higher and higher, a greater and greater impact over time. Um, and they're going to become better and better acquainted with your production systems of choice. So they're going to be delivering better product uh, for your clients, which has got to be a good thing. Um, I talked about defining and changing organizational policy. I don't know if this, okay, this matches, right? So in parallel with enabling your developers, you need to do the things that I talked about with management, discuss contribution, get consensus, and then define proper policies and mandates with, between the IT and the management sections of the business so that you then have measurable uh, contribution over time. You know, measure by number of patches submitted, trainings taken, I don't know. Find things to measure to, so you can uh, know that you're being successful and start to figure out the value that you're getting from that. Um, and developers should ask for clear policies and mandates when they can. Um, and then, if you can, you really need to make explicit time available for uh, contribution um, so that devs can, can practice uh, and, and become really familiar with um, open source project workflows and really get to interact with the communities that are relevant to you. Um, so, a big part of Chris's research focused on integrating development workflows with open source workflows. And when we started talking about this, he had these incredible flow charts. And it was really, really interesting. It was really long on one axis, and then here it had all these things in it. And, and over the course of a few months, we talked through what a development workflow really, really is. Um, and this is what it is. Um, and it's pleasingly simple. You build some, well, you analyze the problem you have, right? And you build something. And then you give it to the person on the next desk, and they say, well, you know, do this other thing and do that thing, and I would have, you know, solved this this way. Analyze the problem again, develop a fix, review it, and when it's ready, push it into production, right? Th this should feel familiar to you. Now, when you share your work with an open source project, the open source project workflow and the internal company workflows are identical, right? So when we've built something that's great, we share it into our open source community and somebody looks at it. Is this patch RTBC or not? Yes or no? If it's not, it can go back into further development, you know, either over here or then out in the community. And we can share these things at any stage, put them into the development stage or the peer review stage until they're ready to be, and to be uh, contributed. 
And, you know, we do this all the time. You know, we take stuff out of open source. And if it's good enough for what we need, we publish it. If it's not, we work on it, we share it back, share the patch review, you know, until it gets to published. And then we also improve on it uh, by the same way. So these, these, um, this ends up being really uh, uh, relatively simple. And if we, so if we've built something that works internally, submit it to the community. Um, you know, even if we start using it uh, in its proto form, you know, we should be uh, able to hopefully, you know, take back whatever the community then spits out in the end. But we've done our part to make, to make all of it better. So at this point, when you're using this kind of a flow, right, contribution has simply become part of how you work. And um, if you include in your definition of done, as I said, that if patches have been written as much as possible, they should be submitted upstream and then integrated. Um, once that all feels OK, you can start to make explicit contribution time available. And you look at companies like Decent, and they do this. Um, Christian van, van Einde, I think that's his last name. I don't remember. Uh, the group maintainer, he gets a day a week to work on whatever he wants to, and mostly he works on group. And group is a great module, and Decent does a lot of projects that use group, but that was, you know, that was Chris's thing anyway. Um, and um, uh, giving people 20% time, giving them a day a month, giving them a day of the week, whatever you can afford, um, lets them focus and tackle much, much harder issues, like really focus into difficult things and become really effective contributors um, and in contribute in, in ways beyond writing code. And that's something to, to consider if you, if you think that your company can afford it. So if we think that contribution is a good idea and if we've got good, solid contribution workflows with our developers, um, what are the ways uh, that we can contribute? Uh, Chris's survey work and our experience in the community told us that there are more or less seven or eight ways uh, that are the most effective. So, and this is pretty simple uh, as well, a lot of this, you know, contributing to code, we wouldn't have projects without what we're doing. Um, and, you know, adding new features, supports feature reuse, um, adds value to everything that we do. Uh, Code reviews are incredibly valuable, and nobody ever does enough of them, and tons of pieces of the project are blocked by not having enough reviews. So if you can do code reviews to help out your colleagues, um, you know, they're essential to code quality. Um, they're required to get code committed. Um, there are never enough of them, and they're just not our favorite thing to do. So um, if you can stand it, like, do a review a day, and you'll really, really be helping people. Um, it's the old classic, but if you actually come across a problem and you know document how to solve it or document some some quirky aspect of Drupal's UI, you're doing the rest of the world a great service. Um, a lot of documentation is missing for Drupal 8. Um, if you look at uh, some other projects, like the Symphony project, for example, it has exceptional documentation, just amazing. Um, you know, and and we can always do better. So if you have the stomach for doing documentation, um, please do that and. Interestingly, um, I found in my old job writing documentation that uh, documentation uncovers UX problems. And it, it can often, like, documenting something can help you write a bug report or a UX suggestion down the road, which is, which is kind, of, um, kind of interesting. You know, if it's hard to document, it probably hasn't been implemented the best way possible. Um, sponsorship of events, um, it's, a, it's a classic. Uh, you guys have a stand here. Um, and you must think that you derive value from sponsoring a lot of other events um, and, you know, getting uh, name recognition and so on in the community is important and, and without you, thank you, like we couldn't do DrupalCon. Um, but it also, it, it enables this knowledge sharing, it, it builds this community spirit thing that we think we have. Um, but I wrote investment here as well because uh, this idea that you should just, you couldn't just pay somebody to get that module ready or to finish that feature while you're in production for an important project, um, it feels like a really, right now it feels to me like a really, really relevant, important way to contribute. Um, so, so sponsors have been investment, like putting some money in exactly the right place where you need it. Um, you can organize meetups, and Public Plan does that as well. Uh, you can, uh, that, and it can get you, you know, 
just knowing the local people around you, knowing local developers, well, maybe you can hire them, maybe you have somebody to help you with a problem, maybe they're just cool to have a beer with. It's, it's all fine, right? Um, user interface and user experience design are sorely needed in Drupal and many, many other open source projects. So if you want to do that, if you've got those chops, you know, please contribute. Um, Evangelizing, telling other people about what we do is also very, very important. If you grow the pie, then we all have more pie, right? Um, and community contribution doesn't happen without promotion thereof in the community itself. So, you know, um, if you're able to create policy within your company to contribute, you have a huge range of options here. Um, you can also take on trainees, you can run apprenticeship programs, you can organize certification sprints. I mean, there's just so many ways to help people if you think of it, and I think the best way is to decide, okay, this quarter, this year, this is what we're capable of, we're gonna submit all the patches upstream, we're gonna run an event, and we're gonna buy, you know, pizza for our favorite module maintainer, whatever it is, make it measurable and make it, you know, have a measurable impact on your business. So, I have so much time, I don't know what's wrong, I'm sorry. I'm, I've run out of slides here. So, so, so we talked about the, the old chestnuts of the open source story, why we should contribute, some of the organizational and, and developer roadblocks a, a, a there and, and how to get around them and, and some uh, actions that Chris and I think are particularly effective kinds of contribution. Really, um, thank you for coming to my session. Thank you for sponsoring DrupalCon, and um, you know, thank you for all your contributions. It's uh, it's great. Let's um, you know, we could probably go and have beers now, unless questions. Anybody? Yes, Christina. Yeah. And do you mean like in a company context? I think a, f a, a kind of a fair measurement in the company context is, is actually your time, right? If I'm your boss, um, I know that I've paid two days of your salary to do that if you've done it on work time. Um, and I would want to celebrate that and count that just as much as a contribution as anything else. Um, some companies have the, um, the page on their website, I forget what it's called now, the give, give back. There was, a, there was a thing in Drupal like eight years ago where we had pushed to have like everybody should have like a, you know, yoursite.com slash give back or whatever it was where people would list contributions. Um, and I think it's really important um, to say, you know, documentation patch, module patch, mentor to sprint, you know, sponsored a Drupal camp. I think it's hard to put a specific value on it, but it should all be celebrated, and you should be acknowledged and thanked just as much for, like, or even more sometimes, right? Documentation's the worst. Yeah. I wrote it for, a, I did it for a living. Um, so yeah, um, I think you should be celebrated for that just as much as anybody else for their contribution. Yes. The company that the uh, can't afford to allow uh, employees to contribute is uh, Zoom. All the, the developers that work for this company are Zoom. The question was, are companies that feel they don't have time to contribute or won't let their developers contribute, um, are those companies or developers doomed? I like that question. Um, Chris and I have given this talk several times around Europe, and we spoke with a development agency in Romania who said their lead developer was offered a job with a significantly higher salary, but where he would explicitly not be allowed to contribute to open source, and he turned that job down and stayed with the agency. Replacing great employees is really costly, so there's a huge value in figuring out how to do this. And honest to God, if you are taking open source code and messing with it internally and delivering projects and you're not engaging with your open source communities and you're not engaging with the products you're using, you're not as good a company as you could be.
right? So that company might not be as profitable as it could be. That, that company might be doomed, right? Because that practice is very short-sighted. You're not investing into your own tool set. That's, that's crazy, right? And developers who find themselves in that situation, if they ask me privately, I'd say, if you have this skill set, you have your choice of jobs, so maybe you could go find somebody else, right? It's, it's a very short-sighted decision, and it's a matter of perception, and it's a matter of shifting your priorities a little bit to get there, but I think it's really important. Tommy. Share a success story, Tommy. Um, I, uh, I used to live in Ireland, and I worked for a company called Enotech. And um, we are given some time, not a lot, but some time to, uh, to contribute. And I, at, at some point, I found the Solar and Search API really interesting. Uh, so I, uh, I invested some time in that, and I contributed some patches, not a lot, but, but some. I made myself familiar, uh, I familiarized myself with the module. And then someone said, you sound so clever about this. Write a blog post. Tell everyone else how easy this is. So I did that. Uh, and we thought that was the end of it. Until a, uh, a company in Germany called us and said, uh, someone from your company wrote a blog post about, uh, about Solar and Drupal and indexing stuff. We want that guy. <laughs> Send him to us. And they said, OK. <clears throat> Uh, and the same thing happened with a company in, I guess, I think it was in the U.S., where they called all the oh, Atlantic. Uh, people in the U.S. don't tend to do that, as far as I understand. Uh, but they called us, saying, we want that guy that knows so much about solar. So, um, yeah, it paid off in several ways. One, thank you for proving me right, because that's awesome. Um, but you weren't looking at me when I was on stage here, but this is just like the best feeling, right? Because it's, it's everything that I said. You profiled yourself as an expert. Your career was improved. Anartec did better, right? More clients. Um, and it was just because you were fooling around with something that you were interested in, not even for production, right? And just writing about it got us all that. That's fantastic. So awesome. Thank you. That's really cool. Oh. Yes. Um, well, my company would like to provide testers and say, please do it, um, please contribute. But um, the time is not really there. So well, we have a project with a time limit. Contribute, please. But there's no time. So you use Drupal? And contributed modules and core? Yes. yes. And your own modules written in the company? Uh, yes. Okay. And uh, so you write patches anyway. Do you do testing? Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> we want to do testing, but we don't have time. Sebastian Bergmann is going to be here to talk about testing, and he's a good friend of mine, and he would... We have a lot to say about that. That's another session that I do. But anyway, so business value of software quality, right? Um, you write patches already, right? So when you submit those, when you write a patch on your branch, right, and it gets... You test it enough, you merge it into... Like, at that point, there's no reason why you couldn't spend... How long does it take to do it? I don't know, like a minute longer to put that up in the issue queue on Drupal.org, right? Um, basically, yes, but if we write, we don't really write patches, we write ugly hacks that somehow we prevent. <laughs> okay, well, okay. Um, I don't, I don't want, I'm, I'm not scolding and I'm not criticizing, like, the reality of working for clients is, can be terrible, right? And, you know, your boss has to pay your salary and you have to deliver working stuff and, like, everybody's under pressure. Like, I totally get it. Um, if you think there's interest at the company about, like, working on this, changing this culture, right, um, 
completely seriously, I can send you Christian to do contribution workshops of how to make that a really efficient part of your day. And I know, where do you live? Berlin. In Berlin. Well, Sebastian is in Bonn, right? But I know that he's very passionate about testing, and he can come up and integrate that into your workflow as well. And I will introduce you personally if you want, um, because it sounds like, you know, maybe that would make your work day nicer. Or we can find you a better place to work. <laughs> Where do we apply? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, who was it, the pre-note? The pre-note, yeah. So, Buddy Breidert is at Einmal Internet. She, in Frankfurt, she's hiring. She said that on stage, right? You guys hiring? Public Plan in Dusseldorf is hiring. Uh, sorry, Lara, did you have a question? Yeah. Mm. Where we ask our wait, 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 wait. Hi. Uh, we have an open Friday once a month where we ask our employees to discuss about problems, to do sessions, to learn and everything. But now, as I heard about contribution, I think I'm going to do it um, as a contribution day where all employees have to contribute something like our project managers, they have to write documentations, the programmers, they have to patch something. So I guess we're going to rename it into a contribution day. Wow. See? And maybe you can send Sebastian to us to uh, teach us how to do this day more efficient for everybody. So, or Christian, yeah. So, yeah. Cool. This is great. That's awesome. But don't tell them they have to. Like, make it something, make it... It's your chance to contribute. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> If you want to work here, you have a chance to contribute. Right. And, and, and he has them... Right. He has them down in the coal mine, <laughs> hidden away from the daylight, coding away at the coal face, right? This is a story that you hear a lot. And frankly, um, I guess if his developers did find out, that, I mean, that's a really shitty way to be a boss, right? I'm sorry. I mean, he might be right. Um, we've seen it very, very differently. We were at an agency workshop a couple of weeks ago in Holland where uh, it was a different technology, but these agencies all use the same technology, and, and we had like a big round table talking about problems, talking about solutions, making plans. Um, they trade developers between the agencies like for projects every now and then. It's like, I just sent my best guy over there, and they sent me somebody, and we did our, you know, because we're doing open source. I mean, it's nothing mysterious, right? They said that that improves employee retention, right? Because everybody thinks, oh, you know, public plan. They've got the pool table. They've got the sauna. They've got the free snacks. Working at public plan must be so amazing, right? And then everybody at public plan is like, oh, my God. Imagine if we worked at um, uh, Brain Bits in Cologne, you know? They've got, like, the wood paneling, and they've got the foosball table, and the, right? But if you trade them, right, you you get new skills and new perspectives and you improve your developers and they see that, hey, you know, Lara's fridge is better and they're whatever, but in the end, it's all the same, right? So it doesn't feel sustainable to me. And if you know those developers, you should invite them to community stuff outside of work hours, right? I think you'd be doing them a favor. Or you don't know who they are. <laughs> Do you know the developers? Well, they might also be really happy, right? It's, 
it happens, right? If we're honest, the number of people using open source versus the number of people contributing is, there's a big difference. All right, is it beer o'clock? I think it's beer o'clock. Thank you so much. Aber sowas von gerne. Ähm, ich jetzt gleich mal eine Karte. Und ähm, ja, gerne. Sehr, sehr, sehr gerne. Und ähm, ich, äh, äh, je nachdem, äh, kann ich natürlich irgendwie so das Geschäftliche ein bisschen gescheiter und mit ein bisschen Grafik und, und irgendwie Mathe und so ja. da präsentieren. Aber ähm, Chris unter, unter Development ist unter Entwicklern, der ist so klasse und der ist, der ist Holländer. Ne? Das heißt, der ist über ehrlich und hart. Also er sagt einfach, was er meint und zuck. Und der ist also in Sachen Softwarequalität und in Sachen Contribution ist er gnadenlos gut und es ist, es ist echt. Nee, der ist Das ist halt leider so ein bisschen schade. Also, so im Prinzip haben wir, kriegen wir Zeit und im Prinzip ist es total gewollt. Ja. Und dann ist immer so dieser Druck da und ah, das Projekt wird nicht. Ja, aber Kunden, aber also, also die Realität, also, da gibt es immer was. Also, es gibt, da ja, ist immer was. Es ist auch wahr und nicht böse gemeint. Ich weiß nicht. Vielen Dank. Gerne. Ich gebe mir Mühe, dass Sie sich melden. Toll. Hey, how are you, man? Do you remember me? Of course. Of course. Of course. I'm great. You seem busy a lot. Is anybody else um, here? Yeah, sure. My colleague. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. How's things? How's, the, how's it going over there? It's good. Yeah? We're, yeah, we're planning in November something. Like, not like an official camp. Right. Like an original gathering. Mm -hmm. Serbia. Awesome. All the Balkan people. I love you guys. So how are things going? Um, good. So, so she and I just founded this company. And, uh, yeah. And I'm doing things okay. What are you, what are you doing? Um, 